Section nine of the Flower Patch Among the Hills. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. Flower Patch Among the Hills by Flora Clickman. Section nine. I had just got settled to work on the missing and now discovered letter when Abigail tapped and entered i'm sorry to trouble you ma'am but could you spare me one of those missionary books pointing to a shelf containing a selection of the annual reports of religious and philanthropic societies now for some time past i had been trying to interest abigail who is a church member in foreign missions i'd rather prided myself that i had done it tactfully not forcing it upon her but just arousing her interest by taking her to attractive meetings i found that she had even gone to one on her own account hence i was naturally pleased to find that she was anxious to follow up the subject but as i did not consider an ordinary official report with its small print and balance sheets and monotonous list of subscribers the type of literature best calculated to enthuse the novice i reached down a small volume of bright stories of girl life in india well illustrated and prettily got up here is just the very thing i said but she took it reluctantly dubiously turning it about and looking it over in a dissatisfied manner no she said it's one like that i want pointing to a solid tome issued by one of the most revered of our missionary societies can i have that one certainly i acquiesced though it was an out-of-date report and i knew the other book would have suited her better yes that's just right she said cheerfully as i handed it to her that other'd be too thin it's to go under the back leg of the side table in the kitchen where the stone floor's broken i've used one like this regular since last summer but it's getting shabby i thought a new one would smarten us up a bit i remember on one occasion being at a missionary meeting for young people at which there was a remarkably fine speaker from the foreign mission field he said that if any felt they had a call to take part in the work in any way he would be pleased to see them at the close when the meeting was over, a small boy approached the platform. "'Please, can I speak to you, sir?' "'Certainly, my lad,' said the speaker, shaking him warmly by the hand. "'Now what is it? You can talk quite frankly to me.' "'Well, I wondered if—er—' "'Have no hesitation, my boy, in asking me anything you'd like. "'Well, do you happen to have any foreign postage stamps?' just as i had settled down again somewhat chastened to my much neglected work there was a knock at the door and the lady of the manor was shown in i see you're busy she began but i won't keep you a moment i only want to ask you if you're expecting miss virginia and her sister this afternoon no oh i'm sorry i did hope they were coming but anyhow whoever it is do you think they would help to-morrow at the sale of work two visitors i was expecting have failed me and i've no one possible for the picture postcards or the pinafores they needn't know anything about it you know it only wants someone who can reckon up that seven penny cards comes to sevenpence and that's one and ninepence change out of a half a crown and that sort of thing now do you think your friends would help but i've no friends coming i said haven't you why I, I quite understood i was calling on miss primkins just now she's jam and jelly you know and i asked her if she couldn't put it on the pinafores it would look quite decorative and in this way i should save a stall even then we shall be very crowded mrs blake had just been in to say she couldn't spare miss primkins the duck she had ordered because you had visitors arriving to-day and would want a pair for sunday oh well i'm not having visitors neither am i having the ducks but i'll come down myself to-morrow if that's any help and keep one eye on the pinafores and one on the picture postcards 
and I think my mental arithmetic will be just right for the change you give. But don't you remember? You've already promised to look after the bookstall. You sent us that big box of books months ago, with some of your own books in, which I want you to autograph, by the way. So I was going to ask you if at the same time you'd manage the jumble corner. The two things would go very well together. I agreed with her heartily. Oh, you know, I don't mean anything like that, she added hastily. I only meant that you could more easily turn from selling lovely books to dispose one of your own done with but still charming coats and skirts, for instance, than if you had to cut up for the refreshment stall and return with buttery fingers to respond to the rush there will be for your autograph. Add the postcards to the books, I said, trying to be equally amiable and abigail will gladly run the jumble corner she will be smarter at it than you or i abigail appeared as soon as her ladyship had gone the farmeress who supplied us with milk was waiting in the kitchen to know if i wanted extra milk morning and evening in future on account of company as if so she would save it specially she was experiencing a shortage of milk hussy having run dry and clover for some unknown reason that i hadn't time to listen to not doing her lactic duty as befitted her station in life emphatically i said that i should not want any extra milk and a few other things i resumed my work ten minutes later there was yet another interruption this time it was the owner of the buff orpingtons who had arrived at the back door to inquire if I was wanting any eggs. She'd brought eight with her and expected another one tonight, which she'd send up, her hens had just started laying again, etc. I fairly blessed the individual who had first set going the fable that I was expecting visitors. I told Abigail that it was a matter of perfect indifference to me, whether all the fowls in the district did or did not accommodatingly lay nine or even ten eggs for my especial benefit but what did matter to me was whether i could or could not get nine or even ten minutes of uninterrupted peace in order to finish my letters before the postman arrived he always calls obligingly at five o'clock for my afternoon mail and I requested that she would kindly take in any and everything that came during the next hour, so long as it didn't need paying for. Only for pity's sake would she cease opening that door and seeking advice on the subject. After that I was left severely alone. From time to time I heard voices in the rear. There was one very loud series of bumps and bangs, I concluded it was the missionary report being introduced to the table. But I worked on, and had just sealed up my last budget of proofs and addressed it to the printers when the postman appeared. I heaved a sigh at the amount of stuff he carried away. The shower had passed over without even damping the blossoms. I would have some tea and then start watering. The postman was speaking to someone at the gate. No, it wasn't Abigail. I heard him say, Yes, this is Rosemary Cottage. I was gathering up my papers as footsteps dragged themselves along the path. Dragged is the only word for it, and before I had time to step outside to see who was there, two female forms, one ample and one spare, made for the door opening into the living room, precipitated themselves into the room and sank into the nearest chairs in the last stages of panting exhaustion, while the ample one, in a coat and skirt of a large black and white plaid, buttoned and piped with cherise, exclaimed, At last! Well, of all the out-of-the-way forsaken places, we've been trampling nearly all day, trying to get here from that wretched station. We must have walked miles, miles up and down hill only it was all uphill we found ourselves in woods with no possibility of ever getting out again 
we got into lanes that ended nowhere and when we got there it was the wrong place we tried to take a short cut across some fields and got stuck in a bog we met a flock of wild cows and the top of that hedge positively ran into me like needles when we did chance to find a house hoping it was yours it never was the people always told us to go on and ask for the directions at the next house we came to but each time there wasn't another house why ever didn't we take that fly at the station but there he could never have driven us all over the huge stone walls we've had to climb we've been walking for hours on end hours haven't we dear dear nodded feebly she was leaning back in the easy chair with closed eyes her hat of a remarkable shape was trimmed with what looked like a kitchen flue brush standing straight upright at the back at least it would have been upright if her hat hadn't shifted askew at the moment the flue brush was inclining towards her left ear her costume was mustard color with spasms of black she must have been very pleased with it when she bought it otherwise she could never have induced herself to get inside it i soon found that the ample one did not require any reply other than the feeble nod as it would have impeded her eloquence she went on i think if you don't mind we won't go upstairs till we've had some tea we're absolutely prostrate aren't we dear the flue brush dipped slightly could we have some tea at once certainly i said with alacrity i had already decided that tea was the only possible way to relieve the strain of the situation and i rang the bell abigail after one comprehensive glance at the callers fetched my very best afternoon tea cloth which she displayed on the table to the utmost advantage that not an irish inlet or a bit of lace border should be lost on the visitors when she does not approve of any callers or does not consider them quite in keeping with the family traditions she invariably makes a terrific splash in front of them getting out the special silver and the finest china and serving with an air of withering superiority as though she said behold this is how we live every day very different from what you've been accustomed to the tiresomeness of it is that when intimate friends call who really matter the handmaiden treats the tea-table most casually they evidently don't count if they are known to be above reproach from the look she gave the strangers i knew we should have it all and we did she was wonderfully quick in getting both the tea and her smartest cap and apron she put as much silver as she could squeeze on the table she got out some eggshell china plates for the bread and butter and the old cut glass for the preserves she opened new jars of plum black currant strawberry and raspberry jam she turned out preserved ginger into a blue chinese bowl she put lemon curd into a quaint brown dish and honey in a luster saucer she hunted out all the cake we possessed and opened a tin of apricots she smashed up sardines with worcester sauce and heaped it on pale lettuce leaves and she garnished some thin slices of ham most artistically with lemon and cucumber and flowering sprigs of rosemary all this while the ample one was explaining to me how marvellously things were managed in london the miles you could ride in a motor bus for twopence the cleanliness and speed and safety of the tube the ever-recurring convenience of a halfpenny in a tram-car and the luxury of a taxi and then more moans to think of the miles they had covered without meeting either motor-bus tube tram-car or taxi when the table seemed on the very verge of breaking down with its abundance and they had just drawn up their chairs abigail asked in clear tones that the visitors were bound to hear would you wish me to bring in the cold duck madam madam indicates company ma'am is ordinary every day 
i wasn't exactly anxious to bestow my to-morrow's dinner on the strangers for i had reckoned to make the duck do for twice but of course under the circumstances i was bound to ask sweetly oh uh, would you care for a little roast duck it's cold i added by way of disqualifying the joint a little in their eyes fortunately they preferred ham but it was satisfactory that at least they knew we had roast duck in the larder after sitting up and taking a little nourishment the wilted ones revived perceptibly and even began to be gracious i am afraid i am not very fond of the graciousness of that type of woman she does get it so mixed up with patronage but i buoyed myself up with the thought that perchance i was entertaining angels unawares though they didn't look like it the ample one continued to be voluble i did not interrupt her with questions because i find it is usually as well to let a situation explain itself it usually does in time besides i didn't quite know what to say i couldn't exactly ask who are you where have you come from and why have you singled me out for this particular visitation yet the longer i waited the more awkward it became to open inquiries you have a very well-trained maid i see the large plaid continued that is to say for the country with emphasis to show me that there were obvious deficiencies only she was willing to make allowances for them it's the first thing i always notice in a house we are used to such excellent service most excellent service aren't we dear dear agreed but not very heartily she seemed to ponder for a moment before she said her customary yes that is one reason why i always hesitate about leaving home how i wished she'd hesitated a little longer the sun was getting behind the fir trees and i did so want to start watering uh, you have some garden i see but it wants planning doesn't it i wish you could see ours at home it would give you some ideas we have a man in occasionally but we always superintend him ourselves i'll tell you how we have it arranged in the centre is a square lawn and in the middle of this we have a round bed with scarlet geraniums in the centre and a ring of calceolarias round them and then outside that at the edge of the bed you understand all around you know we have lobelias little blue flowers you know you've no idea how bright and effective it is and then in the border all round the garden by the fences we have standard roses about a couple of yards apart and a row of scarlet geraniums it's so bright and doesn't cost so much when you buy them by the dozen your ceiling is very low isn't it still for a cottage it isn't a bad-sized room and i see you've made the best of it with your little bits of things put about i do wish you could have heard the charming indulgent condescension with which she said your little bits of things though i don't think i've ever seen yellow walls before very quaint of course but er rather peculiar don't you think so dear dear said she did but i don't know why seeing that she was carrying about more yellow on her mustard person than i had in the whole of the house i wish you could see our lovely dining room at home the plaid continued i murmured in articulations as there was a pause where i was evidently intended to say something it has a dark red paper on the wall we have just furnished it with fumed oak i think fumed oak is so artistic we have a most handsome sideboard that will only just stand across one end of the room i don't mind telling you that it cost fifty pounds originally but as the people to whom it belonged were a little unfortunate we got it well we didn't give quite that much for it uh, but you'd never know it was just as good as new and we have aspidistras and a beautiful palm in copper flower pots really exquisite works of heart they are and they go so well with the fumed oak don't they dear by the time i had been taken over their beautiful drawing-room we had finished tea happily for i already saw a beautiful best bedroom suite looming ahead 
having made a most excellent not to say solid meal the voluble one shoved her chair back and said i feel all the better for that cup of tea now i think if you'll show us the way we'll go upstairs and have a good wash and make ourselves presentable not that you dress much for dinner i suppose i conclude i too was all the better for my cup of tea for i felt myself warming to the work and i led the way washed downwards most cordially i didn't take them out into the hall to the more modern staircase i opened the door in the corner of the room and revealed the steep stone stairs and you should have heard their gurgles and squeals oh dearest do look isn't it primitive and do you go up and down this every day oh no i couldn't help replying we only use this when visitors are here on ordinary occasions we get in and out of the bedroom windows and hop down the honeysuckle she drew herself up reprimandingly she evidently wished me to understand that though she was willing to treat me as an equal so long as i behaved myself she couldn't allow any undue familiarity on my part i don't suppose you would see anything unusual in such an approach to the upper stories having been used to it all your life she said distantly but accustomed as we are to our magnificent staircase at home wide enough to drive up a carriage and pair isn't it dear er nearly dear was the more truthful of the two i fancy and our beautiful pile carpet in rich reds and blues and the thickest of stair pads underneath till you would think you were walking on real turkey carpet this naturally strikes us as how shall i put it so as not to hurt your feelings as uh, as very humorous you know i quite understand i said as we entered my bedroom she walked straight over to the window and looked out not a house to be seen anywhere she exclaimed dismally whichever way you look nothing in sight but those everlasting tree-covered hills as she seemed inclined for a lengthy soliloquy i poured out some water and indicated the soap dish as politely as i knew how to dear who had taken off her hat and coat and seemed almost grateful for my attentions i noticed that abigail had been up and had adorned the towel horse with my finest damask towels with embroidered ends and had got out a rare and treasured bedspread made entirely of lace that had just been sent to me as a present from venice and had put it over the bed in place of the old world patchwork quilt that i infinitely prefer in the cottage it was so much more in keeping with the surroundings the ample one turned with a sigh from the depressing outlook that was so deficient in motor buses and halfpenny car rides and taxis and houses and said evidently striving to make the best of a bad job at any rate you've tried to make it look as nice as you can inside do you know i rather like that bedspread as though conveying a real favour on the article in question it reminds me of an exquisite bedspread we have at home something like it only ours is linen with shamrocks on it in solid embroidery and she flung down her coat and other impedimenta on the top of the lace in a way that made me tremble for its safety it's something like ours don't you think so dear dear had her face in the soft delicious lather of the rainwater and didn't reply but at this point transformation came over the black and white plaid i've only just noticed it this is a double bed look dear it's a double bed and i almost distinctly said in my letter it was imperative that we have two single beds the same room would do i said no need to go to the expense of two rooms but on no account a double bed as i can't possibly rest unless i have the bed to myself i'm a very light sleeper whereas my friend sleeps rather heavily not to say er sonorously uh, don't you dear i must simply insist that you have this bed taken down and two single ones put up in its place had i seen the rooms before i engaged them i shouldn't have taken a place with such a desolate outlook 
but as we've had the expense of coming here i don't mind staying if you undertake to have the beds changed and they must both be feather beds too now can you do this i'm afraid i can't i said but if there can be no ifs i put everything quite clearly in my letter i've got a copy of it here i wrote my dear lady if you will sit down in that easy chair we'll make everything still clearer she was beginning to prance around the room dear unmoved was having a very thorough wash so the light sleeper sank into the chair and rummaged in her handbag presumably for the copy of the letter in question i tried to speak as lightly and soothingly as possible for she was fairly bursting with indignation now please understand that i am delighted to give a meal to any wayfarer who like yourself arrives hungry and tired at my door i'm glad for them to come in and have a rest and even a wash and a brush up if they want it but when an absolute stranger of whom i know nothing demands my own bed and my feather bed into the bargain then i must protest that feather bed is one of my most cherished possessions but you expected me sitting bolt upright i certainly did not didn't i write and tell you we would arrive to-day i've neither heard of you nor from you in my life before but this is rosemary cottage it is then you must be miss flabbers with an air of finality i'm sorry but i'm not at this dear dropped the soap with a sudden splash into the water and looked round in frozen astonishment the merest wraith of it remained two hours later when abigail emptied the water it was a new cake too at the name of flabbers light came Miss Flabbers was a gentlewoman in somewhat reduced circumstances who lives in a cottage a good mile and a half away. Presumably she was going to add to her income by taking in boarders. If it's Miss Flabbers whom you are wanting, I continued, filling up a painful silence, her house is called Rose May Cottage. I expect you got the names confused in your mind. There! it is all your fault said the ample one turning irritably to her companion you said it was rose may cottage when you read the first letter but i said that was an absurd name and it must be rosemary it was intended for country people do write so badly i do wish dear you would be careful to be more accurate if only you had said the right name i might have been saved all this trouble and expense because of course i shall insist on paying for our tea she didn't though and think how many miles i've walked and now i suppose i've to do it all again how i wish i'd listened to that old man at the station and gone with she paused suddenly and threw up her hands and then there arose that cry common to all womankind the world over when they are weary with her pilgrimage footsore and travel-stained the cry that must have rent the air in the olden days when sara trailed after abram across the plains of mamre even as it sounds to-day from yokohama to land's end where's our luggage there was a perceptible gasp and then yes where's our luggage faintly echoed dear as she nervously clutched her gloves with feverish haste and pinned them on her head and then wildly tried to get her arms into her hat i expect it's reposing peacefully in miss flabber's best bedroom i said reassuringly at any rate it isn't here as i saw signs that they were going to crawl under the bed in search of it the man would be sure to deliver it there and abigail knocked at the door and asked if she could speak to me for a minute when i got outside she said there's a person downstairs wants to see you particular ma'am or i wouldn't have disturbed you 
abigail divides all her sex into two classes persons and ladies and no one is more careful than she to see that persons don't think more highly of themselves than their social status warrants i found a pleasant-faced woman who lives in a cottage near miss flabbers please ma'am miss flabbers has lost two ladies rather sudden and i wondered if you'd chance to set eyes on em miss flabbers is that were it as never was expected em by the eleven train and i misdoubt me if the cutlets won't be a bit heavy by now though she's had em over a saucepan of hot water ever since she's so upset she don't know what to do yet she can't go out to look for em in case they turns up meanwhile i thought it'd just be neighbourly if i went out for her and hunted around i know they come by that train for i see to myself at the station puffet ladies you'd have took em for only they wouldn't have a fly they're not friends no nor boarders no she wouldn't think of having boarders so reserved as she is they're what's called paying guests i know because my son's got a friend in the hargus office and he told him about an advertisement she put in only you wouldn't have known it was her being only x y z on it but the people at the hargus knew as the x y z meant her though how they should know puzzles me and they sent on the letters to her but she's kept it very private no one knew they was coming so i wouldn't dream of mentioning x y z to a soul i've tracked em up here everybody all over the common and even up to the crag farm has a seed them they've scoured the country for miles round you'd be sure to recognize them once you'd saw them i should think so e'en the slight harebell raised its head and stared after them whenever they passed it that afternoon i'm certain by dint of shouting above her talking i managed to get her to hear that i had them safe and sound and should be everlastingly grateful if she would take them off my hands and place them in the safekeeping of miss flabbers then i fetched them down and introduced the neighbourly soul who you could see felt elated at the distinction of being the one to take such costumes in tow better go out of the back door i said and up the garden to the top gate it will save you a few steps and then the ample one turned and said icily i suppose we must thank you for what you have done but i do think you should have told us sooner who you were yet i hadn't told them even then it was as they were going out of the back door that dear amazed us by falling unexpectedly to her knees and affectionately clasping a dark object that i had not seen in the dim recess of the lobby here's our trunks she shrieked hysterically and then both those women glared things unspeakable at me they knew now what they had only suspected before that i was a deeply dyed villainess with designs on them and their property what's this why wasn't i told about it i inquired of abigail who naturally was not missing a word old bob brought them while you were busy he said they were for here so of course i took them in madam as you said you were not to be disturbed with an injured sniff and i've had no opportunity to tell you since the two true to the instincts of their sex had promptly seated themselves on the trunks and i feared they had no intention of budging unless the trunks went with them but the neighbourly person was anxious to be on the move she wanted the kudos of walking through the village with them in the broad daylight so she said they'll be all right my husband'll come around for them as soon as we get back now don't you worry the least little bit thus they were got off at last perfect ladies i said to myself as i seized the brown pitcher and the water can and went out to water the spring end of section nine Section number 10 of Flower Patch Among the Hills. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. Flower Patch Among the Hills by Flora Clickman. Section 10. Merely to be prepared. I couldn't have been asleep many minutes, though when I come to think of it, no one ever is in London, because I had waited up till eleven for Abigail. It was like this. The day before, Cook had asked me if she might stay out till eleven that night, as she wanted to go and see an old lady in whose employ she had once been. The old lady was seriously ill. She couldn't get her off her mind, and she felt she ought to give her what little pleasure she could, as she wouldn't be likely to get over it. I begged her to take the whole afternoon. Such affection was really touching. I saw myself in a few years' time, decrepit, aged, and infirm, being visited by a crowd of devoted retainers who murmured, one to another she had her faults goodness knows but at least we will scatter seeds of kindness in any case i was pleased for cook to take some extra time as she is invariably home early the naval division at the crystal palace have to be under glass by nine o'clock she thanked me but declined the afternoon as she thought half past nine or ten in the evening would suit the old lady best she was in a west end nursing home it seemed late to visit one who was so aged and so ill but of course i gave the extended leave she returned at ten fifty five looking very bright a bunch of roses in her coat belt a box of chocolates dangling from her finger, and a program in her hand. Yes, yeah, thank you. She had had a lovely time. The old lady, um, oh yes, she was getting on nicely, thank you. Next day, Abigail came to me also asking for an eleven o'clock leave. It transpired that she was expecting a little orphan cousin to arrive that night from Blackpool such a sad affair child left without a father when it was only four years old she was eight now no she hadn't ever seen the little cousin but she felt it was such a distressing case that it was her duty to do what she could i hinted that eleven o'clock at night seemed rather late for one who was so young and so orphaned to be up and about and likewise offered her the afternoon but she said the train didn't arrive sooner and the trains were often late so i gave her till eleven p m to welcome the pitiful orphan she also arrived in at night looking radiant under her mackintosh she was wearing a pink chiffon dress edged with swans down a bando of sparkles on her hair, a horseshoe of the same make adorning the back of her head, she carried a fan and some flowers that had evidently been worn on the dress. I am glad to say that she, too, had enjoyed herself immensely, and the desolate relative had been most pleased to make her acquaintance. After that I retired and then I conclude it was the bang that did it. At any rate, the whole household woke up with a start, and with one accord the feminine portion precipitated itself downstairs and on to the front door mat, and peered out in the dark road in the hope of seeing something, the masculine element being gifted with the faculty for keeping cool, calm, and collected in any emergency, stayed together up a few wraps and rugs and overcoats, 
and anything else he could lay hands on in the dark including his disreputable old garden inject which he brought down and distributed among us as we had not stopped for much in the way of clothing at that moment virginia and ursula rushed along the road from their own house and joined us virginia was clad in a night-dress with a mackintosh over it and a sumptuous pale blue kimono covered with brown and black flying herons on the top of the mac ursula was wearing her heliotrope dressing gown an ostrich feather boa and an eiderdown quilt they both apologized for calling so late it was past midnight but said they felt they should just like to talk things over while i was bidding them welcome miss quirker from round the corner appeared likewise miss Tresher, a secondary school mistress and her friend mrs brush who shared a flat near by and in the rear came mrs ridley the doctor's widow from across the road they all said they had come because they could see it better from my house which stands on a high point overlooking london one way and kent from the other side each caller was grateful for the loan of a blanket meanwhile in far less time than it takes to write all this fire engines and ambulances and policemen and motor cars and pedestrians appeared as by magic from nowhere and went tearing along the road yet crane our necks as we would not a glimpse could we catch of it miss quirker who always seems to have special and exclusive information about everything said the creature was exactly over her bedroom chimney when the bomb was dropped she heard a strange whirring noise described most graphically and turned on the electric light for company then there was a brilliant flash in the sky yes she could see it above the electric light and the bomb fell she was sure it was in her back garden she looked very pleased with herself and superior to think that she had been singled out by fate for this special and distinctive visitation the man of the house after bidding us stay just where we were as he wouldn't be gone a minute hide him buoyantly down the road in company with neighboring masculines to find the bomb i suppose he soon returned however with the exceedingly flat information that a gas explosion had occurred in the house further along though they couldn't tell whether it was due to the geyser or the cooking range as they couldn't find either later on the remains of a geyser and part of a porcelain bath were picked up about six miles off in the walworth road and i understand that the police at seven oaks found the remains of an alien gas stove wandering about in a suspicious manner and promptly interned it but this is by the way only a gas explosion exclaimed everybody in doleful disappointment mrs brash certainly looked relieved but then she is a very nervous little woman with a weak heart well i call it too bad said virginia every solitary relative friend and acquaintance i possess even to the third or fourth generation has had a zap cross right over their very road and every person i've met during the last twelve months boasts and brags of the way they've had them exactly above their heads and yet 
do what i will i can't get a sight of even the tail of one just my case said everybody else in chorus i seem to be the only one in london who hasn't seen one but miss thresher cut short our bemoanings over the hardness of our lot by saying in her head mistress voice i'm afraid an excess of untutored imagination is one of the weaknesses of this age we however can console ourselves with the knowledge that at least we are truthful and truth after all is the greater asset looking witheringly at miss quirker i replied how about some hot coffee it was the most appropriate remark that i could think of on the spur of the moment cook promptly offered to get it while i went after tea gowns and dressing gowns and similar symbols of propriety for our shivering guests who looked a trifle nondescript now that the lights were on the man of the house had returned to assist at the explosion if miss thresher hoped that her last remark would couch miss quirker she was mistaken nothing can suppress that lady and nothing is sacred to her she will stalk up to your secret cupboard no matter how boldly you may have labelled it strictly private and drag out into broad daylight the most disreputable skeleton you keep in it the one you pack away at the very back of the top shelf and then be painted at your ingratitude as i entered the room with an armful of apparel i heard her saying to miss thresher why don't you put a flounce on the bottom those cheap flannelettes always shrink in the wash oh flannel is it really no one would ever think you gave that much for it would they at any rate i couldn't sleep if i didn't have them right down around my feet to change the subject i asked virginia why she had put her mac on under her kimono when obviously the correct order would have been to wear it outside she said she concluded it was sheer genius and originality made her do it for she had never worn such a combination in her life before and the same must have applied to ursula for looking back on a varied and checkered career she could never remember seeing her sister even once promenading the highway in an eiderdown before at the same time she inquired why it was that i had stood for a quarter of an hour on the doormat clasping feverishly to my chest a pair of satin slippers and a bath towel and clinging pathetically to a bedroom candlestick when obviously any candle would have blown out had i attempted to light it and the bedroom slippers would have been more usefully employed on my shoeless feet while as for the bath towel the coffee came at that moment i remembered that some time ago the kitchen had been very interested in an article in one of the dailies giving various directions as to what should be done in case of bombs overhead i forget a good deal of it but i remember you had to lay mattresses all over the top floors before you came downstairs and you have to dip a cloth in high sulfate of something to hold it to your nose as you came down to seek a place of safety the servants were rather taken with the mattress idea said how simple it was and that as they had five mattresses between them they would cover a good deal of floor space i even generously offered them the two of my own bed if they would come down and fetch them as soon as the zeps were heard 
as long as they undertook to place them carefully above my head. When Abigail brought in the trays, I asked how many mattresses she had laid down. I never gave them a thought she owned up. My two legs seemed all that matter for me, I was sure, I saw the zeppelin thing looking straight in at my bedroom window, such sauce. And tutored imagination again, murmured Ursula in my ear. Nervous little Mrs. Brash said that was just the difficulty. When it actually came to the point, you could think of nothing that you ought to remember. Wouldn't it be well to talk the subject over and decide a few things merely to be prepared now that there was a group of us together? Miss Treasure, who loves the importance of being any sort of office, enthused over the idea, said we had better have a committee meeting there and then. To be forewarned was to be forearmed she told us with an impressive air of wisdom she said she would be minute secretary and we must draw up schedules stating definitely and clearly what a woman ought to do first by way of preparation beforehand and secondly when crisis actually arrived miss quirker endorsed this and remarked in an aggrieved tone in my direction that she should have thought the women's paper would have dealt comprehensively with so important a subject long ago. She added, however, that she thought crisis was far too respectable a name to give them. Had she not been a staunch churchwoman, she would have called them something far more vividly appropriate. I didn't hear the end of this, because I slipped away to find the man of the house as I had heard him returning doors. Opening the study door, my eyes fell on such an uprival that for the moment I felt certain a gas explosion must have been at work there. But no, he explained, turning out yet another drawer, that he was only looking for an insurance policies, as he wasn't quite certain what was the attitude of the companies toward geysers. I pointed out that it didn't matter, as we hadn't one. But we went on looking, and his face wore that tense expression seen on most men when hunting for the family screwdriver, or the pair of black gloves kept for funerals. Having found the policies at last, in the drawer where they had always been kept, by the way, I left him in peace to peruse them at his leisure. The ladies' committee was well under way when I returned to the dining room, and as in the correct thing at such gatherings, everybody was talking at once and on the most diverse topics. I consider myself rather great on ladies' committees. I've even occupied the proud position of being in a chair on occasion. And the more I see of them, the more I am lost in admiration of the courage, versatility, and insuperability of my sex. Why, there's no man living who could trail as many totally irrelevant topics across the agenda, and in defiance of a politely pleading chairwoman too, as can the littlest and frailest woman at any ladies' committee you like to name. As it was, the only one who seemed within a hundred miles of Zeppelins was poor Mrs. Brash, was explaining to Mrs. Ridley. It isn't that I mind dying. We all have to die some day. But I do prefer to die whole. Of course the doctor's widow poo-pooed this as nonsense and asked severely, 
what would become of surgeons if everybody felt like that miss thresher couldn't find a suitable heading for her schedule until ursula suggested antiseptics mrs ridley thought the medical profession might not approve of the unprofessional use of the word but it was accepted by the majority and then we all settled down wholeheartedly to attack the problem from every point of view which included among other things borax as a preventive for moth queen mary's graciousness a comparison of the respective merits of local butchers economizing on corsets and the war loan perhaps you can't see how this came in but it was simple enough miss quicker said that after all explosions that you thought were zeppelins weren't so bad if they enable you to get such good coffee as mine and might she have a third lump of sugar please it was such a treat to get a really sweet cup of coffee she had given up sugar at home as she was economizing on it being the hostess i couldn't exactly tell her that i too was trying to economize on mine from the high price of sugar we naturally floated on to the ruinous tendencies of butcher's meat and mrs brash explained the trouble she had with her butcher because he wouldn't send home all the bones mrs ridley had similar harrowments to relate about her butcher but his vice took the form of sticking to the trimmings from the joints which she was sure he sold at a good price for soap making now that fat was so scarce and soap likely to be dear she knew it because as she reminded us she was the treasurer of the women's league for encouraging the troops to wash and it came very hard on their funds what it would cost them for the cakes of soap they were going to send out no one would believe no they hadn't sent any yet but of course they were going to when they got enough members and by the way would i join she didn't mind a fair charge of course we all murmured agreement war was war and we must expect to pay something extra to help the king keep going he had his family to provide for like any other man neither did she grudge on solitary penny that went to lord kitchener hearty applause no indeed but what made her blood boil was to feel that she was actually washing her hands with her own ribs and at one and three pence half penny a pound too virginia suggested she should try a rather less heating soap but she was drowned by miss thresher who said firmly borax that's what you ought to send to the troops not only would it soften the water for them poor things and no one knows better than i do what awfully hard stuff that german water is nearly scraped my skin off when i went up the rhine two years ago but they would find it so useful to put in with their woolen things that we've been knitting them to keep out the moth my reminder that our troops were not as yet uh, i was drawing their water from german cistern was unnoticed for the mere mention of moth produced extraordinary animation was borax good weren't they a perfect nuisance and so on i said i always put it in with my furs and never had a moth near them i wonder if that's what they put with queen mary's furs said mrs brash i never saw more lovely sables than those she had on when she came to the hospital yesterday miss thresher verified this last statement absolutely superb they were and miss thresher had the right to speak for the queen had bowed straight at her 
as she stood on the curb, as near to her as I am to you. Miss Corker said that for her part she didn't think there was another woman in the world so gracious as Queen Mary, except, of course, Queen Alexandra. She would bow to anyone she saw, no matter how shabby they were. Mrs. Brash hurriedly said what she so much admired in Queen Alexandra was her figure. Miss Quicker continued, Yes, and speaking of corsets, I want to tell you of another economy besides doing without sugar to help the nation. You should buy your corsets several sizes larger than usual, and then, when they are getting worn, you can turn them upside down and wear them the other way up. It's so saving. Ursula said she quite believed it, because she knew if she turned her long corsets upside down, they would reach high enough up to support the military collar at the back of her neck, and thus saving boning. I felt it was high time we got back to antiseptics, and suggested that we should put something in the first column of the schedule, which was headed, things to place in redness beforehand. Mrs. Brash announced that she wasn't ever going to take her clothes off any more till the war was over. If this was the sort of goings-on we were to expect, General opinion, however, was decidedly in favor of, at any rate, removing the outside frock, simply because we none of us saw any prospect of ever being able to afford to buy a new one. Then we all said what we thought ought to go into that column. Woolen undies, a fur-lined coat, a thick dressing gown, a raincoat, a traveling rug, and all sorts of other things were to be placed close to the bedside. This was insisted upon as a matter of the greatest importance, otherwise in the dark we should never find anything, and of course it wouldn't be safe to have a light. Miss Tresher and Miss Quirker had a small subcommittee on the subject of stockings. Should they be worn all night in bed? Miss Tresher said obviously it was the only sensible course. Miss Quirker objected that she should kick hers off in her sleep in any case. Hers was such a delicate skin, as a child people had always remarked on it though probably women less sensitive than herself might be able to endure them. But if she lost hers among the bed clothes, she would never find them in the dark. Eventually, they compromised by agreeing to safety pin a pair to the front of the nightdress, as they fasten your handkerchief to you in the hospital so that at least they would know where to find them in case of precipitate flight. Meanwhile, the question, should hats be worn, necessitated Ursula and Mrs. Brash going into another subcommittee on the lounge. Mrs. Brash favored a shawl, preferably white, being draped over the head. It was more suited to the negligee condition of the hair. This led her to consult Ursula about the winter's hat she was evolving. She had had an exceedingly good white and black crinoline hat the summer before last, and the winter before last she had had a very lovely violet velvet took to the rich deep color favored by Queen Alexandra. Last winter she had taken the violet velvet from the hat of the winter before and put it over on the crinoline hat of the summer before. You can follow this, I hope. And everybody had admired it. 
now she proposed to return the violet velvet to its original toque only this time she would smoother it with some violets she had by her and she had a really beautiful little sable scheme which she proposed to put round the brim did miss ursula think the violets and the fur would combine well ursula said she herself didn't care for fur and flowers in combination because she always associated sables with snowy northern regions whereas violets suggested soft spring days and awakening woods and gardens mrs fresh who had never thought of putting things together in that way before said how very poetic it was then would miss ursula think that quills would look better after all birds and flowers went together ursula agreed and added that she had even found the neighbor's fowls scratching up the white violets one day mrs brash seemed to feel that was conclusive proof of the desirability of the combination and in that case should the quill tilt outwards or inwards no she didn't mean inside the hat of course but across the top or off the head yes perhaps it would be the best to tilt them backwards and she should fasten them with the large cameo that had belonged to the late mr brash's mother prolific details as to the grasping character of mrs brash senior who had never given her a thing except this cameo finally she aired her only anxiety would the shape of the winter before last took still be worn this winter ursula assured her that the shapes of the winter before last will be worn till the war is over and by the time we shall have become so attached to them that we shall refuse to part with them after we had collected a fairly comprehensive pile of clothes including most we possessed and placed it all close beside the bed jewelry came under discussion naturally no one wanted to lose even the smallest tiara and we were all quite sure the government wouldn't include jewelry in the insurance so we collected our trinkets and place them on top of the garments it was astonishing how much we each seemed to possess and how careful we were to enumerate it all mrs brash enlarged tearfully and at a great length on the diamond necklace her late husband had given her this opened up a wider question how about silver plate yes how about the silver each one echoed was it likely we were going to hand over our teapots shoe lifts candlesticks pin boxes spoon and forks hair brushes entry dishes and photo frames to the enemy no indeed not so we all luggage our plate chests to the bedside though miss thresher said she would put hers in all into a laundry bag and hang it on the bedpost it would be easier to carry that way then a number of side issues cropped up virginia had just invested in the war loan there was her script mrs brash couldn't think of leaving behind the portrait of her great grand uncle the admiral always thus referred to as though no other had ever existed whereupon we all remembered we had ancestral portraits calling for preservation after all it doesn't look well if you haven't miss quirker decided she would take the bedspread she had crocheted for their forthcoming red cross bazaar 
but didn't intend to give it to them now it was finished. It was far too pretty. Besides, the secretary had only put her name in a small type among other ladies helping, below the stall holders, and just think how she had slaved over that bazaar. Mrs. Ridley said that whatever else went, she meant at all costs to save the presentation clock, given to her late husband by a very celebrated patient whose name she was not at liberty to state. I'm inclined to think this was mentioned as a set-off against Mrs. Brash's diamond necklace. The late Mr. Brash, though an admirable husband, did not seem to have generated anything remarkable in the way of public steam, whereas the late Dr. Rydell was known to be anything but generous. Mrs. Ridley had no diamonds, but the clock was a solid granite made on the model of a pyramid. It was surmounted by a coy-looking sphinx, representing about a quarter of a hundred weight of bronze metal. Accompanying the pyramid, one at each end of the mantelpiece, was a pair of heavy granite obelisks, like Cleopatra's needle, but just a size smaller. It took both the servants to lift the clock every time the mantelpiece was dusted, Mrs. Ridley explained with pride. Besides, the obelisks were very useful to hang her knitting bag on, and so appropriate to with our brave lads out there rallying around and defending the poor sphinx from the Turks. Virginia whispered in my ear it was no wonder the bronze lady looked so cheerful. So, of course, these weighty items joined the jewelry at the bedside. Other valuables rapidly suggested themselves. Also more sordid things, such as matches and candles, a tin of biscuits, a small stove and kettle, for use if we had to sit out in the road all night gazing at a ruined home. And of course we placed pails of sand and buckets of water close at hand, to use if it should be an incendiary bomb. I hoped I shouldn't hop out of bed straight into the water. Here Ursula reminded me that the pile of sand placed on the platform of our London station several months, or was it years ago, for antiseptic treatment was now sprouting luscious grass. Obviously the lawn mower and the garden roller must be added to the bedside museum. But I told her afterwards she had better keep quiet if she lacks the ability to grasp the strenuosity of any situation where a group of conscientious women are conversing on the subject of doing something. As it was, her remark only incited Miss Quirker to spend a tedious five minutes in explaining to her how impossible it would be for a single woman, with only one maid, to get the garden roller upstairs, and another ten in giving her recipes for exterminating grass, while Mrs. Ridley went off at a tangent on the shortage of gardeners, and the advantages of paraffin over fish oil as a lubricant for mowing machines. I only succeeded in getting her back to the agenda by begging her to advise us, as she was such an authority on paraffin, whether to take an oil stove or a spirit lamp for the outdoor encampment. At length, when any ordinary bedroom must have been packed quite full, 
and suggestive of furniture depository, Virginia's voice rose above the babel. But what I want to know is, how am I ever going to get into bed? You may well ask, said her sister. Look at the time. Just you come along home with me. I'll show you. Where's my eider down? Miss Tresher besought them to stay a few minutes longer, merely to decide what to do when the Zeppelins actually arrived. But Ursula said they had got all their work cut out to get through the preparatory stages of the schedule. So the committee adjourned. As they went out, a figure came out of the kitchen side entrance and made for the coach house carrying a big cardboard box. Is anything the matter, Abigail? I asked. No, madam. I'm only hiding all our best hats in the stable. I expect they'll be less likely to find them there. But the Zepps aren't exactly like burglars, I said. No, I suppose you're not, she replied. But when a creature like the Kaiser gets nosing about among the stars, as well as trying to rampage all over the earth, there's no telling what he'll be up to next. It's as well to be prepared. End of section 10